So once we recognize that, we can go, well, hang on, this is episodic storytelling. Multi-platform interactive is episodic story. That's something I know a lot about. We've been doing episodic storytelling for a really long time. Chaucer, Dickens, Mary Shelley, they're all forms of episodic story storytelling, stories told in pieces. And that gives us a toolkit that we can use. Okay, I'm good at adaptation and I'm good at episodic storytelling. How do I apply that to this new space? And the, and the third one is epistolary. This is a, a word I occasionally deploy and people go, what the hell does epistolary mean? An epistolary narrative is one that is told in documents. And, and the word epistolary comes from the words of let, the idea of letters. And if you think about Jane Austen, right? You know, Pride and Prejudice, huge chunks of the book are told through the letters that she writes or other characters write to each other. This is an epistolary narrative. You think about the original um, Bram Stoker's Dracula. It's entirely told in letters and journal articles. The importance of a, an epistolary narrative is that it creates a certain kind of relationship with the viewer. And this too is something very important because when a story is told in restrictive perspectives, which is exactly what an epistolary narrative is, we've got something that's very much at the heart of interactive multi-platform. I, I once wrote a, uh, an essay on the relationship between Pride and Prejudice and Half-Life 2. For the gamers in the room, Half-Life 2 is one of the seminal first-person shooter games of all time. Truly great game. And Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice is the book that put me to sleep in high school. But apparently people really like. Both of them have exactly the same choices and solutions to how to solve this problem of restricted narration. Because in Pride and Prejudice, it's entirely through Lizzie Bennet's eyes. We only know what she knows at any given point in time. When she thinks Darcy's a bit of a prick, we think he's a bit of a prick. And only as she slowly comes around to the fact that he might be a bit of all right, we too come around to the fact that he's a bit of all right. Half-Life 2 uses this exact same perspective or device because it's a game that relies entirely on first-person point of view. You never leave the character of Gordon Freeman's eyes. You only ever see what he sees. So in both cases, these two stories have to rely on third-party information being brought into the story. Jane Austen uses letters. Half-Life 2 uses radio broadcasts. And in both cases, they're solving a problem of restricted narration. And if we can recognize that, then you're right in exactly the core tool set that can be deployed in a multi-platform space. If you're adapting a play to a book, that's one thing. But if you're in this world, you need to design adaptation from the start rather than after the, after the fact. If you can recognize that your core IP is a story world, then what you're doing is designing adaptation from the beginning. Rather than, I wrote this great novel, and now I hope someone will turn it into a TV series, I wrote it as a story world, designing adaptation from the beginning as part of the process. And this is where we can see there's nothing new about that, but the process has changed. I've shifted it. I now have to think about adaptation as a writer from the outset and design it into the story world so that it can viably manifest those different versions and platforms and perspectives. So a definition of episodic. The design of returnability, of patterns of dramatic questions that compel ongoing engagement. In other words, a story that's designed to make me come back. I get to the end of one part, I, I've got to find out what happens next. I need to come back to see that character engage with that scenario another time. I need to, I need to. Well, if that's episodic storytelling, then the difference again is process. Designing patterns that compel audiences not only to return, but also to move across mediums and to interact in an ongoing engagement. And this brings us back to that idea of how do we light a fire under them? How do we not assume they want to interact or assume they want to go to multiple platforms, but design a structure that will compel them to do so? Because the idea is if you're writing a TV series, you need that hook that will drive people to keep coming back. In a sitcom, it's to see the revolving door of the character reset. In a drama like Breaking Bad, it's what's going to happen next. In a, in a police procedural, it's what's the crime going to be? If we think about it in a multi-platform sense, we have to go, well, okay, what is it I'm asking in this medium that's going to compel them to go to the next medium? Not just return for another episode, but go to another platform. The principle's the same. We've got to motivate it, and that comes through dramatic questions. Will X be able to do Y or else Z? Or various forms of, of questions that the audience is cognitively asking. So an epistolary story is a story told in documents without an omniscient narrator. This is key. That, that, that the notion of that story doesn't have the third body above, the godlike voice that's saying, Jimmy walked into the store and he picked up a can of Coke. It doesn't have that. Instead, you have to see it through restricted points of view. So again, the difference is process, making the audience active in the, st in the storytelling across mediums. How do you create a space for the audience to play? How do you create a role for them to actively within your story world?